Welcome to lecture 4.2, kernels. Recall from the previous lecture that there were two types of homomorphisms. The first were the embeddings, which were those that were one-to-one -one mappings. And the others were quotient maps. So these are homomorphisms where more than one element of the domain maps to the same element of the codomain. Here are some examples. So the one on the left is a homomorphism from the group Q4, these are the quaternions, to the group V4. And so you can see that these two elements map to the identity, these two map to H, these two to V, and these two to R. And it's easy to check that this is indeed a, a homomorphism, i.e. that it satisfies that key property, that tau, I'll just call it tau, tau of X, Y, equals tau of x times tau of y. And on the right, we have a homomorphism from the group Z10 to the group Z6. So this is the codomain, although the image of this homomorphism is the subgroup generated by 3. So the subgroup of two elements, 0 and 3. So both of these are quotient maps although this one is on to and this one is not. Not embedding homomorphisms are called quotient maps, as I just said, and we'll see shortly how they correspond to our quotient process. And you can sort of get a glimpse of this right here. I mean, if you imagine on the left, if you put big nodes around, around these, these pairs of nodes, you can sort of see how collapsing out these supernodes will leave you with a diagram that looks like this one. So that's a preview as to what's to come. Here's a useful definition. If phi is a mapping from G to H, that's a homomorphism, and we take an element in the image of phi, so that means it lives over here in H, then define the pre-image of that element, H, to be the following set. So we write it like this, we write it like phi to the minus 1 of h, and it's the set of all elements in the domain that get mapped to h. And I want to emphasize that I'm writing it like you would if it were phi inverse, but phi does not need to have an inverse. If this mapping is not one to one, then phi inverse does not exist as a function. However, we can still define this set to be as follows. So here's a picture. So this is sort of a cartoon picture. We have a domain on the left, a group G, and the codomain is a group H, and phi is a homomorphism from G to H, and here's an element A, and its preimage is this collection of elements over here. So I've denoted this as capital A, but I can also write phi inverse of A. And phi inverse of B is this set right here. So this is something I say observe. I don't know if you've noticed this before, uh, but it's, it's always happened and, and it always will happen. But the preimages of all elements have the same structure. So in this cartoon, the preimages of elements, if we were to draw them in the Cayley diagram, they would have the same structure. And here's one more definition. The preimage of the identity element is called the kernel of the map, denoted like this, K-E-R of phi. If you are in linear algebra, you might call this the null space, but we usually call it the kernel in group theory. And it is the set of all elements that get mapped to the identity. Let's make some observations about preimages. So observation one, as I said before, all preimages of phi have the same structure. I'm not going to prove this formally. We'll do that pretty soon once we understand exactly how these things have the same structure. But let me give you a sketch of a visual argument that should at least motivate why this is true. So let's pick two elements, A and B, in the image and let capital A, as we did on the previous slide, capital B, be the respective 
for images. So let's consider any path between elements in A. So A1 and A2 are two elements, and let's let P be the element that corresponds to the path from A1 to A2. Now for any B1 in B, there's a corresponding path starting at B1 and following the path according to P, and that gets to some element B2. And we need to show that B2 is indeed in B. So let me, let me show you a picture of this, although it's gonna, not going to last forever because I'm going to cover it up with the next few lines of the proof. So here is, here is A, and here is A1, and here is A2. And there's a path that goes like that from A1 to A2. And now consider B down here, and let's pick some other B1, let's call this B1, and follow the same path. So path corresponds to P. So let's follow that path P. It doesn't need to be an edge, it could be a collection of edges. And our claim is that wherever that thing ends up, let's call it B2, has to be in capital B. So this, this is the pre-image of A, and this is the pre-image of B. And what that would show us is that for any little piece of the Cayley diagram in here, there's a corresponding piece down here. So what comes next? Well, let's see. So over here on the left, this, this is the group G, and phi maps the group G. So G is, let's see if I can draw it, G is something like this, and phi maps G to this group H, which is over here. And of course, it maps everything in capital A to the single element A, and it maps everything in capital B, the pre-image of B, to the element B. So that's the picture that we have. So now what can we say? Well, let's look at this element, or look, look at this path P right here and see where that gets mapped to. So P is a path that goes from A1 to A2. So because of the homomorphism property, P has to be a path that goes from, or phi of P is a path that has to go from phi of A1 to phi of A2. So in other words, phi of P has to go right there. So phi of P has to be the identity path. Okay, so, well, first of all, why is that? Let me see if I can sketch that out. So phi of A1 P is phi of A1 phi of P and what is that equal to? Well, phi of A, so phi of A1 P is phi of A2, so that's phi of A2, and what is it, where does that get sent? A2 gets sent to A, so that's equal to A, and so what does this get sent? So this thing has to be, so phi of A1 is A, so that is A, Oops, A times phi of P. So here's the algebraic version. A equals A times phi of P. And that tells us that phi of P has to be equal to the identity in H. So you can answer whether or not you like the picture proof better or the actual formal algebraic argument. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that phi of p is just the identity 
path. So let's apply that to this down here. So B1, it's mapped to B2. And so phi of P applied to B, phi of P maps B to itself. And that means that B2 has to get mapped to B as well. And that means that B2 is in fact in the pre-image of little b. Because if it wasn't in the pre remember that's what we had to prove, if it wasn't in the pre-image, if it was out here, then it would get mapped to somewhere else, and this would not be the identity path. Okay, so now I'm going to get rid of this picture so I can actually finish, finish the rest of the slide. So pause the video and take notes if you want it still in front of you. Since homomorphisms preserve structure, the path phi of p maps phi of a1 to phi of a2, and these things are, are the same element, they're, they're just a, so a1 is equal to a2, which is a, and this has to be the empty path. Therefore, the empty path maps phi of b1 to phi of b2, which means that phi of b1 has to be equal to phi of b2. So by definition, B2 is in capital B because it has the same pre-image as B1. In other words, both of these things are equal to B. And that's the end of the proof. Clearly, G is partitioned by pre-images of phi. Okay, I said clearly. Let me justify that. Well, here we have G. That gets mapped via phi to a group H. And well, by the definition of a function, every single element in G gets mapped somewhere in H. Right? So take take any any little G. That gets mapped somewhere in H. And therefore, it lies in some preimage, namely the preimage of H. So clearly, every element in G lies in some preimage. So G is partitioned by the preimages, and we just showed that all of the preimages have the same structure. Does this sound familiar? What does this remind you of? Well, if you said cosets, you're right. Before I make the explicit connection to cosets, let me formally define something that I've casually defined, that is the kernel. So the kernel of a homomorphism is simply the preimage of the identity. So in set notation, that means it's the set of all elements in the domain that get mapped to the identity in the codomain. Time for observation two. It's got two parts. Part one, the preimage of the identity, let's call this capital K for kernel of phi, is a subgroup of the domain. And part two, all other preimages are left cosets of K. Let's prove these. So to start, as we said, let's let capital K be the kernel. And we have to show it's a subgroup. So let's take two elements in K. And we have to show that it satisfies three properties. It contains the identity. Is that true? Of course, we already know that homomorphisms map the identity in the domain to the identity in the codomain. So that one's done. What about closure? Phi of A times B is phi of A times phi of B. That should, that should be the first thing that you want to do when you see that phi of A times B. And now what are these? So, well, that's the identity, and that's the identity. So this is just E times E, which of course is equal to the identity E. And that's what we wanted to show, that if we have two things in the kernel, then their product is in the kernel, because their product gets mapped to the identity. And finally, inverses. Suppose A is in the kernel, we want to show that A inverse is in the kernel. So we have to show that A inverse gets mapped to the identity as well. As, as we learned in the last lecture, 
phi of A inverse is just phi of A inverse. That's because homomorphisms map inverses in the domain to inverses in the codomain. So what is this? This is phi of A inverse. Well, phi of A is the identity. So this is the identity inverse. And of course, the inverse of the identity is just the identity E. So we're done. We've proven that K, which is the kernel of phi, is indeed a subgroup of the domain. So that's the end of the proof. Here's the box. And actually, because of this box, that probably means that I'm not going to show you that all other pre-images are left cosets. So I lied. And that's probably because it's going to be on the homework. So let me show you how to get started. So here's, here's a group G. I always like to draw a picture. And here's H. And phi is a homomorphism from G to H. And H has an identity element. I'm going to call it E, because that's easier. And the preimage of E is, is the kernel. That's This is K. And there's going to, let me make that a little better. And there's going to be a bunch of elements in here, possibly. And we have to show that all other preimages are left cosets. So let's take a different element. Let's take element H. And let's consider the preimage of H. So that's going to be a subset over here as well. It's going to have a bunch of elements. And we claim that this is a coset of the kernel. Now, if that's true, that means it does not matter what representative we take. We can take any of these. So let me just name one of these. Let me call this little g. And then if that's true, then this is indeed the left coset g times k. And you may ask, well, why isn't it the right coset? Well, a spoiler, the kernel is going to end up being a normal subgroup. So this is going to end up being the right coset kg as well. OK, so where were we? So we have to show that the preimage of H, so let's write this down, so claim the preimage of H is the left coset G times K. And let me just remind you what, what the left coset is. That's the set of all products G times little k. G, of course, is fixed, and so little k ranges throughout k. So instead of saying little k is in big K, or that it's in the kernel, I'm just going to write that phi of little k is the identity. So it's that set. So how do we prove that this set equals that set? In general, when we have two sets that we want to show are equal, we have to show that one of them is a subset of the other and vice versa. Now, this seems like overkill, but it, it's not that bad. Let's take an element in the first set and show it's in the second, and then take an arbitrary element in the second and show that it's in the first set. So we have to show first that phi inverse of H is a subset of G K. So let's let's take something in here. So let's take something else in here. Um, so some other element in here. Let maybe let's call it G prime. So let's take some G prime in phi inverse of H. And so that just means that phi of G prime equals H. And let's show that it can be written 
as g times something in the kernel. So let's let's write g prime equals g times a little k. And so what you have to do is you have to tell me what little k is. And I'll let you finish this because I think, as I said, it's going to be on the homework. I don't want to do the whole thing for you. But let's look at the other direction. So if that's 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 the first inclusion we have to show. The second one is we have to show that I'll use a different color now. G k is a subset of phi inverse of h of the preimage of h. So this one I claim is a little bit easier. Let's try it. Let, let's take something in this left coset. So let's so let's take g g times some little k, and we claim that th so this element so something in here. We claim that that is in the preimage of h. How do we show that? We have to show that phi maps this. To h. And how does that work? Well, phi of gk equals phi of g times phi of k because phi is a homomorphism. And what do we conclude? This is phi of g, which is equal to h, right? Because G gets mapped to H. And what's phi of K? That's the identity element. Because K is in the kernel. So this, of course, is equal to H times E, which is equal to H. And that's what we had to show, is that an arbitrary element in the kernel is in the preimage of H, meaning it gets mapped to H by phi. So I'll let you write this up formally in a nice mathematical proof on the homework. And hopefully this is enough to get you to get you more than started. Observation three, something that I mentioned earlier. The kernel of phi is a normal subgroup of G. And that's why we didn't care whether we used left coset or right coset in the previous observation. To prove this, let's let capital K be the kernel of phi, as we did before. And now to prove that something is normal, recall that we have three ways to do that. We can show that all the left cosets are right cosets. We can show that every conjugate of K is equal to K. Or we can do probably the most common method, which is take an element in K, any element, conjugate it, and show that it ends up back in K. So that's what we'll do. We'll take any lowercase k in the kernel, conjugate that element, and show that it has to wind up in the kernel. And this turns out to be straightforward. So let's take any element g. And remember what we have to show. This being in the kernel means that phi of that, phi of g, k, g inverse, is the identity. So phi of g, k, g inverse, what do you want to do when you see this? Of course. You use the fundamental homomorphism property. This is phi of g, phi of k, and phi of g inverse. Now what do you know? Phi of k is the identity. So we write it like this. And now, remember that homomorphisms send inverses to inverses. So this thing here is just phi of g inverse, which is going to end up canceling with that. So we have phi of g times phi of g inverse, which is the identity. And that's what we had to show. We took an arbitrary conjugate of k, and we showed that phi sends that conjugate to the identity, which means that that conjugate, g, k, g inverse, is in the kernel, and therefore the kernel is a normal subgroup of g. Here is a key observation. Because the kernel is always a normal subgroup, then given any homomorphism phi from g to h, we can always form the quotient group g mod the kernel. And again, that's because the kernel is normal. 
And this observation is so important that it will lead us to what is called the fundamental homomorphism theorem, which is the topic of the next lecture. We will finish this lecture with two visual examples, one of them involving multiplication tables and the other involving Cayley diagrams. So for the first, let's recall that the cyclic group C2, we can think of as multiplication of the second roots of unity, so on the unit circle, in the complex plane, there's one second root of unity and there's another. These, of course, are positive one and negative one. So that's these two numbers under multiplication. And consider the following quotient homomorphism. So phi sends the group D4 to C2. And we can define a homomorphism by where it sends a generating set. So let's define phi of R to be 1 and phi of F to be negative 1. And from here, it's not hard to check that phi of any of the four rotations in D4 is equal to 1, and phi of any of the four reflections in D4 is equal to negative 1. So think of phi as the mapping that inputs a rigid motion and outputs plus 1 or minus 1, depending on whether that is orientation preserving or orientation reversing. I'd like to impress upon you how this quotient process can be thought of as shrinking D4 down to C2, and this can be clearly seen from the multiplication tables. So at left is the multiplication table for D4, and I've intentionally grouped the rotations together as the first four elements and the reflections together as the last four elements. And in doing this, you can see how the rotations appear in the upper left and bottom right corners of this table and the reflections in the upper right and the lower left. So if you apply phi to these elements in the middle, then you'll see that you get plus one for the rotations or the non-flips and you get minus one for the others. So the homomorphism can be thought about as replacing elements in D4 with this plus or minus one. So that's what I've done here. And this can be thought of as the Cayley diagram of C2, which is this diagram here on the right. This is our last example, quotients via Cayley diagrams. And this will motivate the topic of our next lecture, which is the fundamental homomorphism theorem. Define a homomorphism phi from the quaternion group Q4 to V4 by sending I to V and J to H. Now Q4 is generated by I and J and therefore we can determine where phi sends the remaining elements. I'll just show this to you and we'll check a couple of them but I'll let you check the rest on your own. But first let me remind you that V4 consists of the elements E, V, H, and R. And let's use these for the arrow colors. So here's the Cayley diagram of V4. So phi of the identity in Q4 has to be the identity in V4. So phi of 1 is equal to E. Phi of K, well, K is I times J. So that is phi of i times phi of j, which is v times h, which is r, the other element in v4. Now, let's check one more. So phi of negative 1 is phi of i squared, which is phi of i quantity squared, which is v squared, which is the identity. And I'll let you check the others as well. They're straightforward. So notice that the kernel of this map phi consists of 1 and negative 1. These are the two elements and the only two elements, 1 and negative 1, that get mapped to the identity. So let's see what happens when we quotient out by the kernel. So we start by drawing the Cayley diagram of Q4 organized by the subgroup generated by negative 1. This is the kernel. So there's that subgroup K 
and its left cosets are the identical copies of K throughout the diagram. So the left cosets of K are near each other, so we can put a super node around each left coset, and then to do the quotient process, we shrink these nodes, and we get the following. So Q4 mod the kernel literally is the group of four cosets, K, IK, JK, and KK. And now what does this diagram look like? What does that remind you of? It should remind you of the Cayley diagram of V4. So that's my question. Do you notice any relationship between Q4 mod the kernel and the image of phi? And the image of phi is, it's not this, it's technically the group V4, so it's what you get if you have the same diagram, but you replace this with E, V, H, and R. So of course, the right answer is that these two things are isomorphic, and that turns out to always happen, and that is the fundamental homomorphism theory which we will learn all about in the next lecture.